LA on a gorgeous Saturday afternoon. So much appreciation, especially for, I see a lot of East Side contingent down here, which is nice. <laughs> you, you may not realize what a big deal that is for people to come here I'll from downtown. It. Yeah. It's like a whole thing. You should feel the love. I'm from the East Side. I mean, it's it's Illinois. Illinois. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty far east, right? <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you that for now. For now. But we'll talk about that. We'll okay. come back to that. So, um, um, I guess just by way of starting, so uh, for those of you who don't know, so I'm Shana Dan Broderman, art critic and curator, Patty Astor, legendary curator of Benjamin. We all know each other in a weird sort of social, a lot of Facebook first mutual friends kind of way um, and so what's kind of exciting for me is that you're gonna kind of watch us like meet in kind of on camera like that we really you know have saved it all for for now like we've never had an in-depth conversation about your art we're gonna do that for kind of first time and that's really interesting for me because usually when I do these talks it's because I've done something I've written the book on the but you know there's some reason why and I know everything, and I know what I'm gonna ask, and it's and so I'm really looking forward to kind of learning in real time with everyone here as well. It'll be fun. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, and I guess you know, and it, it, if if Patty doesn't mind, I'll ask, the first, I'll ask you the first question, which is, you know, for those of us that maybe um, and it's fairly likely might be seeing your work in person for the first time. Um, to really just tell people what they're looking at. We talk, it sure. says reclaimed wood, it's, it's vintage signage, but like literally, what is it? Like where did it come from? How did you get it? Are you sneaking into salvage yards <laughs> at night? Are you stealing signs <laughs> off abandoned hotels? Like where, where does, where is it reclaimed from? Sure. And then we can sort of all bounce around and talk about like why and, and how. Well, you know, being from central Illinois, there's plenty of dilapidated, derelict uh, barns that are this beautiful patinaed, like silvery gray color. And uh, we've got about two generations of people in our family, you know, starting with my dad's father, who built his home out of reclaimed wood. And then he's got five brothers who are in the building trades, and they all built out of reclaimed wood. So I would be the third generation of people. So when it came time to build our house, I, of course, built out of reclaimed wood, which is, you know, it's, it's sustainable. It's beautiful. I mean, it has a patina that is unmistakable and it can't be faked. I mean, people try with stain and things like that. But uh, so I do, it's all legit and sanctioned. I, you know, I find the buildings and approach the owners and, or use local people who have done the same already and you know, have some stashed away here or there. And a lot of the barns, like if they're close enough to like a major road, uh, Route 66 runs through there, they will have had like a, a big kind of billboard sized uh, sign advertising to all the traffic that would pass. And so in tearing them down, you know, I ended up with a stack of these cool old uh, vintage advertising pieces. Uh, and I had worked in advertising for about 15 years. So I kind of had a, a, a affinity and appreciation for it. But I didn't appreciate the uh, consumerism message <laughs> being conveyed. So I thought, well, maybe I'll hang these in my house when I'm done. But I never did that. And because I'm like, what are my Applebee's or something? You know, I mean, I'm not, and I don't even agree. I don't, you know. Well, Cafe 50s is two doors down, and that's why <laughs> I mean, that's what you're not doing. Indeed, but, yeah. Okay. I un, I'm <laughs> deliberately undoing that consumerism message and recasting the, you know, I, you know, I feel like the word magic that was used to you know, manip manipulate behavior through those original messages is recast for the purpose of nature because it reflects, these patterns reflect uh, natural growth structures and all that under that umbrella people could refer to as sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's why the signs are chopped up and reconfigured and yep. some of it's legible enough and in your titles you will embrace it a little bit like that's called crush and it's all yeah. an orange crush and things yeah. like that but to kind of that that's why you're using them this way. It's not right. just, it, 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 in other words, there's content. It's not just like, this will look cooler if I make a no. puzzle out of it. It's like I'm no. disrupting the function of advertising, even and though I love the color and the... Yeah, it, um, and a lot of that idea I had had academically from having 
gotten you know training in college at, in, in uh, semiotics, but um, after being introduced to the one of Patty's artists that she uh, curated back in the day, uh, Ramelzy, he had an understanding of words. I mean, this the show is called Word in part as a tribute to Ramelzy, who Jim Jarmusch uh, credits with having been the first person to use the word word <laughs> in the you know like the the Modern hip hop uh, uh, vernacular. vernacular yeah word up you know, the, you know that was uh, uh who did, who had that uh, uh cameo which word, was then, yeah, word up yeah, yeah which they then licensed for a cherry coke commercial see no, later I'm, let me find I'm an ad tell, it's not i will fault. deconstruct that I'm ad just telling you, right? <laughs> we all know cherry yeah. coke right okay anyway so yeah that was um <laughs> You know, it's like, uh, I'm like humbled and honored to even be sitting next to Patty here having be the, you know, she's got like, we, she's like, I know. We hung out Friday and even, you know, now that she's out here on the West Coast, she has such like a nose for finding the authentic aspect of wherever she's at. Like we went to all these different old, she was call them surf geezers, but these guys that were shaping, it's on camera now, I'm sorry, but uh, they were shaping surfboards and stuff and, and is you know, like they're real artisans and it, it was, you know, she immediately found that culture here after finding this, you know, urban graffiti and street art culture in New York and she's got an uncanny nose for finding the authentic wherever she's at. So Kai, do you see I mean, so you, you see an affinity between that kind of thing, say that surf and kind of counterculture. It seems weird to call it that now, but it always has been that until recently. And this kind of thing that Benjamin's doing. Well, I think something that's interesting, uh, I think the uh, main way that Benjamin and I got to know each other was through another artist, um, the one and only devious Doe's from <laughs> Rock Steady Crew, Doe's Green, who I met first when he was 14 and he was a break dancer in Rock Steady Crew. And then he um, took the um, poise and um, understanding of the world that he gained through that experience became quite a good visual artist in his own right. And it was sort of through Facebook that Benjamin and I hooked up through does. And I think that the, I mean, the art that I've always been interested in is art that comes from, you know, the people, the street. It doesn't matter what people or what street, you know, it can be anywhere, you know? But as long as it's real, yeah. you know, then you, that's, you've got it going on. As soon as people, I mean, people would come into the, the fun gallery and, and say to us, you know, well, first they would say, I, I, I got art and I can sell this art, I got the plan for it and everything, I can, you know, explain all about what my art's all about. We just go like, whoa, you're definitely in the wrong place. <laughs> First of all, we never sell any art here. <laughs> but it was kind of, I mean, I never even wanted to have an art gallery, but the art gallery, the art that comes from within, you know, from a source, it's just like, it's just like, um, the artist John Ahern. It's just like so. Benjamin was going around, you know, looking for re, you know, recycled, you know, wood and stuff, and he got this great idea, and then somehow filtered it through his, you know, other understanding of art. I mean, that piece right over there could easily have been done by Crash. Right. You know, yeah. he, uh, you know, kind of is another very famous graffiti artist, um, who kind of just. But filtered a little Lichtenstein through his sensibility. But if it it's something that if it comes from the surroundings and it comes from the people, then it just has an energy that you just you cannot mistake it. You just can't mistake it. I agree with that. And what, one thing that I'm really intrigued about the work is that there's a level uh, in looking at it that it has a kind of folk outsider quality to it. But then 30 seconds uh, into meeting you, we're talking about Buckminster Fuller and the semiotics and <laughs> sacred geometry, right? And all this really, you know, sort of academic stuff. And yet the work has that exact sort of authentic quality that kind of seems like it's going to exist outside of that 
realm of that, you know, sort of high concept. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd love to hear more about that in the sense of kind of, you know, because there, there's a, like a, God, it's so, I hate the word spiritual in art because then people kind of go, they do make that noise. <laughs> and, I, right? and I do too, but it is sacred geometry and I have a, yeah. I have a fractal tattooed on me. So I'm kind of down, even though I have a fancy art history degree too. Mm -hmm. So what to me is what I'm really interested in is sort of the way that you have, uh, because I know that you spend a significant amount of time thinking this through, yeah. is how you see the relationship between the kind of authentic folk kind of impulse right. behind the materials yeah. and that kind of thing, and then also the theory and the sort of math and geometry and maybe um, just for the camera a couple of minutes about the kind you know, people know about Buckminster Fuller that might be the, the only kind of oh, esoteric architecture that, right. that, that has penetrated the general consciousness right. and so people know about geodesic domes and right. that's kind of in the vernacular you know in the sort of regular vernacular a little bit but it's the opposite of outsider and so you kind of have both going at the same time and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about balancing that and sort of like what came first or how sure. how hard it is to keep those things the down. Farmland in central Illinois by virtue of geography I am outside of the loop you know pretty far. And, uh, so <laughs> That's dad laughing on camera you can't see him. So you know and I, I don't so that's in me, you know what I mean? And these are, this medium are the materials that are made available to me by virtue of being there. And, uh, you know, the, the, the conceptual stuff, those ideas are things that I've been exposed to um, just, you know, uh, through the course of my life. And com having, using this as a way to kind of fuse and combine them together, really, I mean, it's basically, you know, you have, like you say, it's almost schizophrenic, but you know, and it, I don't want to have like hierarchical levels of meaning. Like one's more deeper, like the spiritual is better than the, the folk. They're more like multiple lanes of meaning that are, tr you know, trying to be maintained. Where um, for me personally, you know, I have a bad kind of a collector's bug, and I have real nostalgia, and I, you know, I I want to. Uh, you know, I like the 20th century and everything that it represented advertising-wise, but again, it doesn't, it's not progressive and it's not forward-looking. Um, so when you in, infuse the idea of advertising with, um, you know, uh, sacred geometry and the geometry that's present in uh, geodesic domes, then you're kind of, this reconstruction of these pieces is advertising on behalf of those concepts. So it's like, a, they're like, um, you know, almost new messages being sent out in that way. And well, that makes a lot of sense, especially in terms of, you know, the artists that you and Patty have in common, because yeah. what you just articulated could easily be transposed onto many street artists and what they're doing. They're doing that exact same thing. They're taking the strategies of advertising yeah. and they're repurposing those in posters and murals. Yeah for communication direct with the viewers yeah. in the same way that advertisers do it, right. but with this other message that's more about yeah. humanity and existence. And you said any street, but maybe any rural route, <laughs> dirt road. <laughs> any dirt road, any. That's what I do, I use the phrase keeping it rural. You know? <laughs> 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 I am keeping, yeah, keeping it rural. I mean, like. The cab is here. <laughs> I had to do it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to have a slogan, having worked in you know, commercial art for right. 15 years, yeah, it's good. Sure. I, 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 uh, you know, I can't help it. No, no, I, that's a good, that's today, that's definitely the hashtag of the day though. Girl. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. I know, I'm actually, I'm actually gonna use that in my Facebook right up <laughs> <laughs> You so definitely free. have to. Give but I mean, shout out. And yet, it's people from these very sort of self-consciously cosmopolitan situations like rock stars at Art Basel or you know us here in this you know West Side Gap who are really attracted to the work. Yeah. Do you find that that's kind of what happens? Like that it's like 
fancy big city art folk have become obsessed with this? Yeah. Like, what do you think that's about? Well, like for, for me personally, you know, trying to purge my affinity for the past, like we're doing that culturally because we're attached, you know, we're at this crossroads where these old ideas that we had about consumption aren't going to be able to be, go forward into the future. So, you know, it's like you got to, we're all doing that in, in a sense. So when people see it, regardless of where they're from, they're, they feel that, you know, it's like, I love the colors, I love the graphic element of this advertising. And, you know, but now that it's, you know, reflecting natural growth structures, then that it's, it, it's more meaningful than just saying, you know, drink more, eat more, buy right. more, that type of a thing. And, uh, Would you, know, you admit, or like, is it okay with you if people read or uh, sort of environmentalist message onto this as well? Because a lot of, you know, the use of reclaimed materials goes beyond, although it's a very deep pool of charm and nostalgia and memory. Yeah. There's also a sort of like, don't cut down a new tree. Yeah. Here's a bunch of wood that's already ready, just use that. Yeah. And so there's an aesthetic dimension that is emotional yeah. uh, and narrative. And then there's also a literally like recycle, save the planet yeah. narrative too. And right. that has maybe goes back to a little bit of what Fuller was oh, sort absolutely. of up to. So that's in there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of mid-century modern architecture, even when we were over in Her Hermosa Beach, even though I've tried to purge this collecting bug out of me, Patty caught. Die? No, <laughs> I don't buy anything. I, we were walking around checking things out, and I saw some uh, uh, Herman Miller chairs being thrown away, and some. Uh, uh, it's like seven people are like, Gasping. where? <laughs> They're like gone. <laughs> a Pierre Paul and Artifort. Uh, lounge and stuff and uh, so you know we said what's going on with this stuff and scavenged it out of there so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of um, mid-century modern architecture and kind of built our, my house in that style even though it's out of reclaimed wood and um, when I was trying to kind of you know also having worked as a commercial artist and advertising you know just for me I was trying to make a break with that so like metaphorically destroying advertising was like trying to this for me personally like I'm not going to do this anymore and I'm going to kind of shift and Buckminster Fuller is someone that I identified as you know a hero and that I would start basically um, giving my energy towards promoting his legacy and um, you know his in a lot of this geometry like the one that's behind us right here is like a flattened two-dimensional geodesic dome. Like these are the, this, this the way that this hexagon, you know, blends into a pentagon and all the, the triangulation is how the geodesic domes are so efficient because they reflect the way that nature builds. That's why it ends up being efficient. And uh, so this is like a 2D flat, 2D version of it. So like in trying to promote Bucky and get his home on the National Register and some of the other buildings that he built in Illinois, he was a professor in Illinois. So we have some really. It's so funny because Frank Lloyd writes from there too, right? Yeah, there's some. So if there's something, something in there. out there. <laughs> Louis Sullivan's from. Well, yeah. you know, he rebuilt Chicago. In, right. But, That's really interesting. So yeah, Wright was Sullivan's draftsman. And it goes on down. Now, Pat, I'm, here I am. You say we, you know, we, we can't get so academic and talk about our art like what it's about, right? No, it just looks right. good. It just, it looks, just looks good. It just looks cool. Well, I mean, what, I mean, <laughs> honestly, like the best. You know, people ask me all the time. You know, what's good art? And it's sort of like, okay, well, you know, go away. But one of the answers to me is work that can operate on more than one level simultaneously. So that's the beauty of it is like, you know, the balance of the panel is like, you know, there's a level on which this just sort of has its aesthetic pop and its obvious sort of sensory appeal yeah. and you're allowed to touch it. Not, yeah. I mean, don't get crazy, but it's okay a little bit, right? It's pretty you're gonna get, You might get a splinter, watch it. It's dangerous, yeah. It's yeah. You might get a little, <laughs> but I mean, it has that kind of, but then you can go and get all like nutty pants with Buckminster Fuller's, you know, esoteric yeah. you know, language if you want, yeah. but it's absolutely not necessary to the understanding of the piece. You can really have it both ways. Yeah, and that was, um, the, Patty had mentioned uh, Dose Green, and uh, he identified, like, he saw a video of uh, the house that we built out of reclaimed lumber, and he was living in New York at the time, 
and wanted to move out to Hana, and he was like, you know, yo, I want that. You know, design <laughs> me that and Hana version of it. So we went through all of that and did it, and that was about the same time that uh, Patty was uh, curating Art in the Streets here in Los Angeles, and you know, who, you know, she had that opportunity to recreate the fun gallery, and you know, in my opinion, that was the saving grace and the shining star in that, in that show, of which, you know, Doze was a part of as a member of Rocksteady crew, so that was where, uh, you know, that six degrees of connection ended up happening. Yeah. And uh, I'd know. be really curious to hear from Patty too, like how you feel like this work lands on that continuum of the kind of like punk and post punk and in the industry art that, you know, you've been such an, you know, such a denizen of, like where, um, where you see work like this um, on that spectrum. Well, I think one thing, again, you know, it just goes back to the whole, you know, keeping it real. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag. Word. Um, but the thing that was, I mean, the thing that was really so interesting messy. about, you know, when, because, I mean, the whole, the fun gallery kind of came about because, well, I always say the fun gallery started the day I met Fab Five Freddy. Um, <laughs> But the whole thing that was so important to that year, which was 80, 1980, 1981, was the meeting of punk rock and hip hop, because they both came, we just got along, because we both, we both came from completely bombed out communities. You know, no one had any formal, you know, training, or nobody was even, I mean, thinking about having an art career? Uh, no. You know, that just wasn't kind of the, the thing that you were thinking about. You were just thinking about, you know, just this, you know, we just want to create and do this and have an idea. And we were all making it up as we went along, just like the hip hop guys had all these, made up these personas and the graffiti guys made up their personas. You know, so were the punk rock guys, you know, and all the punkers downtown. And it was just such a natural fit. And so this I just see as the same kind of thing. If it comes out of the, you know, just comes out of the community. And also I, I think it's incredible that, um, it's something that's very gratifying to me. And, and, you know, it's now through the years, it's been 30 years, that, that, that outreach, that spread has its Stopped. And so Doze could meet Benjamin, and I could meet Benjamin, and Benjamin and I can talk about Ram L Z. It's, <laughs> it's that kind of thing that makes it all worthwhile. The, like, you know, the, the sales, the auctions, the sales, the, that kind of thing doesn't matter. But that's what, you know, really, you know, I think that's what really art is, and that's why people go to the wall for it. If you're not willing to go to the wall for it, then you know, belong at Fun Gallery, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll applaud that, definitely. And I mean, speaking of which, I mean, I just have like a quick question. I mean, it, is this as labor intensive as it seems like it is? Yeah. I mean, you're in there and it's like, <laughs> there's a lot of, there's math and band saws and you're cutting rusty metal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, I, you know, I, it, because some of the work, this one on canvas, this one here where there's a little bit of hand painting, yeah. you know, it, it references mixed media paintings and the kind of mainstream of art history and it has those things in it and, you know, a Lawrence Wiener or somebody who uses text as an element of composition, like you could do all of that. But I'm looking at these and I'm, what I'm thinking about is the guy in the studio making these because yeah. it I don't seems know. unpristine is a word, but it just like you know it, it isn't as sort of physical as it yeah. as it seems like it is. Yeah, I mean, I even make efforts in my craziness to do as much of it by hand as possible because I feel like if I'm transmuting the original message and you know then I it's almost like I'm trying to do it on a physical, not just a mental level. Like I, I cut it by hand with shears, I cut the signs, and then I um, put down like a metal ruler and then bend it like, you know, kind of almost origami, like over the, over the metal straight edge to, so that, you know, to get the little folds and stuff on the, on the signs of, you know. Do you get hurt? I, um, not Because I mean, I, I, I cooked dinner last night and I'm rocking a double band -aid. 
I thought that was just okay. for, for the look. No, no. I like I decided to see if the pot was hot by touching it. Forty-five year old woman. Is that hot? Okay. So yeah. I'm just saying, like, then I look at this and I think, how are you yeah. not covered in like scars oh, and burn marks and bandages? <laughs> right? Which kind of reminds me of your guys too. I mean, they're out there and there are ladders yeah. and you know, it's like so yeah. you know, is okay. that important? Reynolds, he probably gave his life to his art. Too. That was, yeah. I mean, he, because yeah. he, I don't mean to get off topic. No, but it's on topic. The, the uh, you know, he, in those closed space in the battle station, working with those resins and spray paint and stuff, the fumes in there, I've heard, you know, people, you, 30 seconds, you're high. Like, oh, I, no, we just, I just did these two panels long. with Dave Torje and, and the Locos, and he couldn't make it because he doesn't like how a mask feels when he's resining his pieces and his wife is yeah. standing over there screaming at him to put his effing mask on and he's yeah. like, it gets in the way of, you know, and, yeah. and so, so there, that's the, a real, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean, the like there's a physicality. is important to me. Your like, body. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, you know, like hands on getting in there and uh, working with the material and I honestly, I try, like, through Ramel Z and uh, a few other, you know, does and, you know, you start to, you, you hear their perspective and you start to think about what you do if you're working in any kind of uh, creative medium, even if it's commercial, that you are, at, you know, doing a kind of magic. Whereas, like, in the truest sense of the word, you know, from the idea of spelling, you know, if you're using a sequence of symbols that are in this case letters to present to people that will shape their behavior that I mean that's 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 magic and if I'm doing it on behalf of people who I don't even necessarily like or have you know we don't our values don't mix like that, the head of coca-cola or <laughs> right, whatever okay. right I not that I ever had that opportunity but you know I um, was doing it for you know the Midwestern version or whatever that was and I you know eventually at some point I felt like I'm gonna use my magic on behalf of the things that I like. And um, I think that's what, you know, Ram and Doze's idea of... Uh, well, so it. many of our, you know, contemporary graffiti and street artists, that's exactly what it is. It's like, you know, some of them are appropriating the language and the aesthetics of advertising and stuff from within. Yeah. I mean, a lot of those guys had like, have like graphic design degrees from Art Center and like went and worked in what they later came to consider the belly of the beast or the Death mm -hmm. Star or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they came back out and they started subverting some of that yeah. for, you know, using their powers for good and yeah. that kind of thing. You hear that a lot well, right, talking yeah. to these artists. So One thing is like, you know, when, when, if you know anything about marketing, the research shows that people make decisions based off of fear of loss not reward of gain. So if you want to create effective advertising, a lot of times you're gonna to have to push people's fear buttons. You know, and that's not, I mean, that's that's not something that you want to invest your life's energy in. Well, you don't. <laughs> well, if you, Speak for yourself, think, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would think if anybody stopped and thought about it for a minute, they wouldn't want to. Well, no, but that is really interesting and that's why I couldn't help but use the word spiritual that maybe, both of you can help me come up with a slightly better word than that because we all made that noise, even I made it when I said it, yet yeah. I'm looking and there's, you know, there's sage smudge sticks in some of the works or mm -hmm. this chakra piece mm -hmm. where, you know, we talked a little bit about bef before this idea that, you know, there's this m meridian and I mean, right. look through the, see right there, look at that basketball graphic on the right. back of that Coca-Cola can. Yeah. That's like, that's what's up. Hold yeah. that up, Brian, for everybody. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, this is the shit that exists in yeah. our public culture. People who know how the brain works, like yeah. you're talking about, understand those things. Right. Yet this one, with some living elements and things like that, you know, and also Fuller, which is why he's such a counterculture hero, even though he's about as academic a figure as you could imagine, he's become a counterculture hero right. because he was trying to do that too, like create kind of a societal realignment through public structures and the way yep. that architecture was something that he understood activated and contained energy and then when people were in the structures they were affected by that and so mm -hmm. 
but at the same time, buildings that you know could stand up and have function and be right. buildings. They weren't just like yeah. conceptual, you know, yurts or something. They were like right. for use. <laughs> I mean, right? So he yeah. was doing something similar like that too. Totally. Yeah. So he would not. Your patron saint would not be upset <laughs> if we used words like magic and alchemy. And I don't. He had a, a big metaphysical aspect to it. I mean, he metaphysical. That's our word. We'll that's say that. Good with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We found it. All right. We'll say that. <laughs> Everybody would be so much happier, myself yeah. included. Yeah, I mean, yeah, beyond physical. I mean, there's, uh, you know, there, his designs in architecture are more of like architectural metaphors for his uh, philosophy. And we, we have uh, in the audience a, a Buckminster Fuller playwright, D.W. Jacobs, right over there. Do we? Yeah, he wrote a, uh, uh, you know, with the cooperation of Buckminster Fuller of State, wrote a, 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 an acted a one man play that he is been going around for 15 years. How oh, fantastic. Years. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you, and by the way, everyone, I always forget to say this, I'm such a dork. If you have questions, don't like wait till the end, just go there. Like if you have yeah. something you want to say, just feel free, so. But uh, yeah, he recently got to perform his play himself in the, the building that I helped promote on the campus that Bucky taught at, and it, um, Again, it it straddles. Western? No, no, a Southern Illinois. Southern Illinois. With, with my father went there, I went there. So it, it so this building uh, it straddles the Earth's 90th longitudinal meridian, which is the only North South. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the only North See, South. That kind of stuff is interesting. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, okay. I just I, I respect your opinion so much, and here I am. You know, he knew me too. Talking about because I I was uh, my big thing is like I said before is like you know I couldn't stand when um, artists would come in and like you know be able to explain their art but I'm talking in a in a marketing sense you right know? I mean but oh. when you hear like the nerd stuff I didn't know I was like well, okay, right. 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 right I was like well, I didn't know I could get nerd totally like nerdy oh yeah me right away. I mean, they might, oh, you know, they'd sit down and be like, oh, right. yeah, and you know, and that, and I paint like this because my dad had this, like, blah, blah, whatever. I'm like, fine, great, bring it in. Yeah. You know, but, you know, no, but it was the guys that were like, yeah, I really know what the market needs right now. Take a hike. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when he would go on about yeah. the 90th, God, yeah, get nerdy. With your blessing, so the 90th longitudinal meridian is the only north-south meridian of, that goes all the way around the world as the 90th. So it's, it, it goes through um, New Orleans, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, St. Louis. Um, it goes through Frank Lloyd Wright's studio of Taliesin in uh, Wisconsin, in Canada, Siberia. Um, it goes through Tibet, uh, Bangladesh, and uh, back around. But it was significant to his legacy because he, the first thing he did before inventing the geodesic dome was he invented the, a new map. It was the first uh, patent awarded in cartography in a very long time. And he I wanted to... Know that. Mm -hmm. Is that that one that flattens out yes. and everything looks all weird? Oh. It, yeah, it's, yeah, the Dymaxion map. <laughs> like, all the previous maps were called Mercator maps that hang in the classroom. So we're talking, you know, the 2D representation of the, the three-dimensional sphere of the planet. So One effect of which is that Africa looks a lot smaller than it is, and exactly. the way people live looks bigger, and yeah. that's like just an accident. Right, and the United States is directly in the middle. Accident. And there's huge ocean barriers on either side, like Africa's over there, way and over Asia's there and over there. Yeah, Greenland's the size of Africa. <laughs> yeah. You know, Canada, you know, and, and Europe is enormous. Because it, when you pull that off of the sphere, the poles get stretched. And if you know you're, you know, from a northern hemisphere, your 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 country is huge. Uh, so uh, he that irked him. He wanted to have a. He was all about accuracy. He wanted to have an accurate picture of the world. God, God forbid. Yeah, exactly. So what he used instead of the uh, equator was the 90th longitudinal meridian because like you know it goes all the way around. So his map is this north-south oriented map where the Earth peels off from the North Pole, and you can really see it almost looks like an island, especially when, you know, you think of the, if the, the North Pole had previously been covered by um, uh, snow cap, 
And anthropologists love this map because you can easily see how you know, people migrated out of Africa through Central Asia and walked up through Russia and Siberia, crossed that snow and Alaska and to Canada and down, populated the Americas. And you, even if, you know, you get this real sense of that, oh, we, I spent more time in this climate so I may have light skin and straight hair, and, but you spent more time in that climate, and, but, but you have dark skin and curly hair or vice versa or whatever, but we're all of that island. And he coined that phrase spaceship earth too, which was a great Yes he did. We're hurtling through space on this sphere and but uh, you know that's so Bucky I like it that you said it's my patron state. That's multi planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Ram L Z. Multi plan oh yeah. Mold he, the Maldi planet. Yeah, yeah, he had the he had this whole Ram Z, you know, this mythology of um, all of these extra dimensional beings that were betting on, you know, the going on on planet Earth through and you know the the letter races the letter, yeah. and which I thought was cool because it I thought of it also as a double entendre for race in some sense of like if you have access to this language you know King's English or whatever then you may be able to get into the halls of power more easily mm -hmm. and if you don't you know and and you're more of the vernacular of the South Bronx or whatever that maybe you would have difficulty mm -hmm. getting accessing those halls of power. And, and he, you know, convinced a lot of the guys who were younger than him, like those, you know, you can gain letter combinations in this um, stuff that he remembered from a past life as a... Uh, yeah, a and actually, yeah, and I also just want to interject yeah. here a kind of a point of what that was, you know, incredible about the rise of hip-hop is that the, I mean, you know, 19, the same thing, you know, 1977, Ford says to New York City, drop dead. I mean, hip hop came up from the fact that these kids were told, I mean, you're not going to be part of this culture, you know, you're black or Latino, forget it, you're not going to be part of this culture, it's not going to be open to you, your opportunities are being on drugs, going to jail for drugs, or getting killed. And the school system had given up on these people. They had no, you know, the little, you know, I grew up in, I grew up in the Midwest. You know, there was, you know, I went to art class. I had my own viola for music class. You know, that stuff did not exist for these people. They didn't have a culture. They were shut out of the culture. And the system made it very clear to them that they were shut out of that culture. So the way that hit, the reason that hip hop came up is because they invented their own culture, and as Fab Five says, it included music, art, dance, language, and so it is an invented <coughs> culture. It took over the world. Which took over the world? Yeah. Yeah, and I just finished uh, about a month ago watching Roger Gassman's new movie, Wall Riders, that was about that exact thing, and I mean, it, it opens with like somebody like a Walter Cronkite doing a walk through in the Bronx in like a trench coat going, look at, literally, look at these animals. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not surprised. And you're like, oh my God, shut up, that's about to, and then it was New York and Philly, and you're like, don't talk that way about cornbread, like, oh my, like he, what? But they talk about exactly what you just said, and that it was <clears throat> a, a, a cryptic system of letters and numbers derived from their names and the streets they lived on that started being those things. So it would be, you know, JS152 or something like that. And that would be, and everybody kind of followed that formula for a while because that was talking, yeah. because that was like their nickname and the street they, literally the number of the street they were from. Yeah. And that, and they just started walking, it was just Sharpies, and then people started kind of like train spotting them, so they yeah. everywhere they'd go, they'd be like, oh, you know, he, there's yeah. another one, there's another one. Then it, there became such a proliferation that people started wanting to separate themselves a little bit, so they started adding crowns and stars and little flourishes, and then that started to be, you know, eventually became the realm where the fonts became sort of unreadable, and then you started getting wild style kind of later. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, it's exactly what you're saying. It's like, well, I don't consider this vandalism. I consider this like, I'm alive, see? Mm -hmm. And they would write them this big on like billboards in the subway in Paris. It wasn't, they weren't destroying anybody's property. They were just kind of going, we exist. And that truly is like a couple of guys with Sharpies mm -hmm. saying, fuck you, we're not animals. We live yeah. here and I'm going to literally leave my mark on this place. And it was friendly. Yeah. It wasn't gangy. It wasn't any of that stuff.
stuff that people were trying to say that it was. And it's exactly what you just said about creating your own power dynamic. Then. Well, it was a I mean, it was because that was, again, I mean, the whole gang culture was like, fine, that was part of the go to jail, die for drugs, you know, it was that kind of thing. And, you know, it was actually Africa Bambata that, um, in 1974, Bronx River Projects founded the Zulu Nation, so we've got to stop killing each other because we're falling right into their plan. And so, you know, it's if it's very hard. I mean, I had an artist who um, he was from the neighborhood, one of my neighborhood kids. His name was Eero, ever rocking on, and uh, it's an incredible talent from the from the neighborhood and just you know started to hang out at the gallery and I got him um, got his pic got a picture of his painting super fresh in Newsweek magazine cool. with Keith Heron and some other people in this article and he took it to his school and he showed his teacher and he said look I have my picture in Newsweek magazine and she said you're never gonna get anywhere with that art stuff forget it Right. You know, so, I mean, if someone tells you, you've got two choices when someone tells you you have no value. You can knuckle under and say, okay, I don't have any value. I'll just shoot drugs and kill myself or kill, take a couple of my brothers down with me while I'm at it. Or you can say, I'm going to reinvent myself and come within, come pull from what I have within and make something of myself. And that's what really the hip hop culture was all about. And many others too, I mean. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, there really are affinities because I would imagine, too, like we've talked about your specific background and how it's like a third generation thing with this relationship to architecture and the place you're from. Um, but then obviously, you know, education, not a problem, access to education, not a problem. Um, you know, getting a building on a national landmark registry, that's a very, like, within the system kind of amazing thing to do. But also around you, I would imagine, would have been another kind of artist which maybe would be more of that folk kind of outsider artist that would flourish in that kind of environment where you know you're not the f one of, you're not the first person to look at these found materials and decide to make something out of them right. your your voice with it is unique because of your background and your story and who you are and what you're doing with it yeah. but the idea of kind of mining and salvaging and salvaging in more ways than one, right. like in a literal and a metaf sort of more esoteric sense, the, the stuff of the past, you know, that seems to me to be something that, you know, comes out of that part of the country. Yeah. You know, is that something that you were seeing or con conscious of growing up also? Well, I think that that perspective is the perspective of someone from here looking at the Midwest. Like you don't see- I'm actually from New York, okay? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> totally different, I'm sorry. I, I mean, you, you can't see the forest through the trees necessarily, is what right. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. You, you don't analyze it in that way. You, um, I don't know how to describe that, but you know, you just, um, it's too close to you to really uh, analyze in, 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 in that way. It's just a part of your reality and it's just a part of your existence, probably in the same way what Patty was describing about the guys, you know, from New York when they. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, all that, the subway cars were already covered with that by the time I was allowed to go out of the house by myself in the mid 80s. So yeah. there was never, I don't remember it happening. It just always was. And I never thought about it. It was just like, the subway was covered with writing, and some of it was awesome, and I didn't think of it as new or transgressive or anything. It just was part of what my world looked like. Right. So maybe something like that. It's, it's, it's like that. I mean, there's not a ton of artists um, in central Illinois, and that's a thing I personally been trying to remedy by volunteering art teaching in our uh, school because they can't even afford to have an art teacher. And art in general, is something that people, you know, on the coast do. And I hate to even say it, like what, you know, the perception would have been when I, you know, I've always, always been interested, you know, I've done, I do art, that's what I do. That's, I can't, I mean, that's what I've always done. And that's how I see the world and that's how I interact with the world. But it's sad to say that the perception, you know, from my childhood would be that that's gay. You know what I mean? That's that's something 
that people in San Francisco, those queers out in San Francisco, are doing. <laughs> I'm sorry that you're going to be so blunt. No, you don't but mean gay that's, like, you mean no, homosexual. No, actual gay, gay you don't people gay do like that. You mean gay like not so gay. No, you I know this is like it's probably hard people. to understand, but huh. that's the culture. But again, I grew up in Chelsea, so I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm telling you, that's why I'm, I'm <laughs> saying your about? perspective is very much outside yeah. of the culture. Yeah. And so, yeah, with you, Halloween, I don't just know, even caring about you know designing your house or designing the inside of your house, interior designers, even probably every bar stereotypically game. But when you care about aesthetics, you know that's a right. that's a cultural cancer because there are talented talented artists throughout the Midwest probably who have that feeling suppressed because it's perceived to be that. The, that's what the others do. But and then, like, you know, big honking pieces of burnout wood is very macho. <laughs> and sharp metal, sharp bending sharp right. metal with your hand is very she manly. Me. She got, yeah. Oh, well, I'm trying to prove so that. So, that's your cool. No, I mean, it's just, you know. So <laughs> She's good. Yeah. So you're all right. It's right. All right. <laughs> Although that brings me back, to, I did have one specific question I wanted to ask, which is about the painting. So, in like that one with the circles, but especially this one that's mounted on the canvas and there, and is newer. Words on the other side of it. And yeah. are the so um, why start painting? Why start or painting or making over references to painting as a thing? Yeah. Um, it, and is that a, it, is that new because those yes. are new works? Yes. And what's that? What 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 is going on? With that? Well, with the abstracting the letter forms, um, it's always interesting to me. Like the letters get made primarily by the shape that around them, the, what they aren't. And I think that from you know that's like uh, reality is mainly uh, you know defined in that way. I, like I I learned in, in school and with the semiotics that we don't necessarily ever know what a single word means, like blue. We only know that it's not red and it's not green and it's not yellow and it's, you know, we, we, we inventory that entire, uh, you know, our lexicon of words that are, are, are not blue. So it's right. defined by what it isn't. So it, with this painting, I'm kind of doing, doing the negative space that uh, defines the, the, the what isn't the letter form or what isn't the message. And that's kind of a concept, again, like, we're safe to use the word metaphysical, that, you know, it's a metaphysical concept <laughs> that, you know, we're within this thing, you know, this universe that is, you know, it has a density. Like, I, I heard a fact that, like, the subatomic particles that make up what we would perceive to be solid matter, you know, relative to their size, it has a, they have a more vast space inside of them than we have inside the solar system, you know, relative to the size of the planets, if you can, you know, follow that logic. As a, just as a ratio. As a ratio to the solid. There's more negative space in between the and, atoms and, and what we solid. perceive as solid. Right. So that, if you follow that logic, then we're inside of something more solid than what we perceive to be solid, you know, here. And like that is, you know, idea that, you know, the space. It's not my fault, Patty. I'm sorry. <laughs> you made the license. You said, get nerdy. Get nerdy with that. <laughs> but yeah, space, the empty space around us is not empty space. You know what I mean? Essentially. Yes. And that, you know, and, you know, into that whole sacred geometry idea and typeface and font. Like um, the font on the Met, you know that M. You know how they draw, as it's like Times Roman, and they draw it by drawing shapes around it. Right. And then, you know, the negative space of those shapes form the letter. You know, and this all kind of then kind of circles back to Ramsey, who I you know put right there with Buckminster Fuller and Patty. Uh, the um, uh, you know he remembered past lives work style idea of what you're talking about, and. If you think that that's a bunch of, uh, you know, BS and a bunch of new aging nonsense, the proof is in the fact that he said if you do this and you execute it well and you project it into the culture through the subway system, then you will uh, revolutionize global culture, and it, it came to pass. Well, two so. things, and I mean, a like the wild style was not about legibility; it was about recognizability, but not necessarily legibility. Mm -hmm. And 
and also those illuminated manuscripts and stuff like that. And I was thinking about this like 15 minutes ago when we were talking about this. Is that shit was in Latin first of all? Mm -hmm. So nobody spoke Latin, mm -hmm. much less were they being taught to read Latin. Mm -hmm. So it was on the. So that's how you got the whole culture of the illuminated manuscripts and stained glass windows. Was that the practice of disseminating the Catholic doctrine was such that you wanted people to feel that they understood it, but didn't have unmediated access to it. So there were still gatekeepers that were the Latin-speaking yeah. priests, priests and monks, yeah. but that if the object was obviously text, but sufficiently beautiful and elaborated upon, mm -hmm. that would inspire the yeah. kind of faith and devotion that was the idea, right. but without actually handing over the secrets of the content to just whoever. That's that language. And so as a, that whole yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And so part of like, for example, the first people that translated the King James, the, the Bible into the King James version in English were like persecuted as heretics. Yeah. You would think they would be celebrated as heroes because they were making something more accessible to more people, but yeah. it was the actual opposite. Right. They got in hella trouble for translating into English in the beginning. Right. Because that was removing a kind yeah. of gift. So there is, re I mean, there is kind of something there in this idea of using text as a graphic way of communicating when it's text. So you'd think it would be about the content, but so often it's not. No, it's like what Patty was describing about, you know, using it as ways of keeping people out of mm -hmm. access and power and keeping people out of cultural, you know, expression and, uh, you know, another artist that Patty curated, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, you know, basically the same thing, you know, using, um, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, about uh, that, you know, that transition from Samo and, you know, the walls and uh, into, you know, doing that on canvas, like, I mean, you witnessed that firsthand, all these guys transition, you know, you gave them keys to the kingdom too, in a way, by giving them access to space, by not judging and you know, I, you never distinguish between art and graffiti art. It's art, right? I mean, it's just, yeah, it's art. It's all art. Yeah, I mean, I do think, I mean, that, just that was one thing. Just, I mean, the fun gallery was not planned, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> I got kind of sick of having the parties in my apartment. And it was just <laughs> <laughs> But it was just such an organic scene, you know, that it just was going to break out somewhere. And um, but that was, I think that that was, you know, our, our biggest contribution was that um, we, we didn't. Uh, oh, everybody. Well, first of all, the, again, and this is what's so interesting about these things because what I love hearing is like the genetic, like the the reason behind, you know, why somebody does the artwork a, a certain thing, you know, like like ben just, Benjamin just runs into a bunch of stuff in a barn. I mean, the, the original fun gallery was so small that we couldn't even consider having group shows. We had to have one man shows. So, um, and but you know, I just thought that you know every artist was just you know. They're, you're good or bad. I don't care where you come from, you either got it or you don't. And so we did, um, one of the things that we, we did do was uh, we, every artist just got a one-man show. So it didn't matter if you were a graffiti artist or you were not a graffiti artist. If, it, what mattered is, are you the best? That's what mattered. <laughs> and what was really touching and great is to see like Arch Connolly, um, another farm boy from Iowa, who was, <laughs> He was actually one of the more sophisticated artists that we had, and he did all these great pearl sculptures and so on. But to see him having like this serious discussion with Zephyr about the game, you know, that's what it's all about. So we, you know, every artist got a one-man show, and um, I think that we are also responsible for breaking the color line in the uh, established art world. So we're proud of both of those things. Yeah, I definitely. I think you should be, and I, I love that you know, you're here and part of this because things do evolve and stay the same as you go, you know, generationally. And so to be able to see the sort of, you know, legacy of that play out in this, which comes from such a different, and then that's a new kind of hybrid thing. And then that's what our moment's about now is all this other kind of meta stuff and taking that and 
you know, reconfiguring it in a new way, which is what's happening materially, but mm -hmm. it's also happening aesthetically and, you know, with the purpose. And I guess I kind of, when, when, you, when, you, when I asked about the painting and you started talking about defining things by what they aren't, I think that was kind of the answer because what winds up happening in, in looking at that piece and that piece is it doesn't make it a painting, it reminds me that it's not a painting. Yeah. Is, is that yeah. kind of what you meant? I, well, I, did, I didn't do that necessarily deliberately, but um, there, it needed to be, you know, like with, with that one in particular, I was thinking that that is reorganizing itself necessarily then, the, you know, the, the original sign's abstracted and deconstructed, but it's reorganizing itself and the painting is the, the, the metaphysical aspect that is like these, you know, energy that is causing the reorganization to happen um, in certain areas of the painting. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, yeah. like uh, that is basically like kind of like, a, for me, like a visual metaphor, this idea that like all the matter in the world was previously something else. Like it can't be created or destroyed. It cannot it can be created be or destroyed. Exactly. Right. Like we were, you know, we're like Joni Mitchell. Like that's we just are science. Star stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. just that's just that's science. just science. <laughs> but my, well, I mean, but no, but in all seriousness, I mean, so that actually, I have a question for you. And then I just looked. We've been talking for an hour. I know, right? I don't feel that way either, and they all seem fine, but an hour, that's how great this is. But, um, but so when, when a piece is happening, yeah. it, it, what sort of, and I'm sure the answer is it's different every time, but if you could characterize it, is it like you have a vision and, for a piece, and then you go and look and see what you have in the barn already? <laughs> or is it like you you drive around waiting to find some stuff and yeah. it tells you what it wants to be? Do you do you sketch? Do you mm -hmm. when it comes to where you're gonna cut the words up, do mm -hmm. you look at the whole thing and sort of draw yeah. it? Or is it like you know, you can't get too sure. just intuitive because you have to it's There's hard. A, yeah. If you can't erase it, you've cut the wood. You, but like what what is kind of first? Yeah, you want you. me to give away the secret sauce? You do not, I guess. <laughs> you don't have to. You're I would like, like yeah. that, but you don't have to. No. <laughs> but yeah, if you want, I really. Well, you're 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 on mic. Yeah. Don't forget, you're on mic. Right. You, uh, you basically touched on yeah all the different influencing factors. A lot of it starts with a concept like like I got stuff that I'm desperately trying to communicate that I'm passionate about that um, you know, I learned from a lot from building that house that I built out of the reclaimed materials because I wanted it to be efficient and full of light but I didn't want it to lose a lot of energy out the windows that were bringing the light in and I get migraine headaches and I didn't want it to have like petroleum products in it and I like plants a lot and all these factors went in and I was, uh, I had some time to research how to you know, build in that way and there's like a whole building practice that's like pre-industrial revolution where you align it to seasonal sun angles. And like so in our house on the uh, winter solstice, no direct sunlight comes into the, I'm sorry, the two thirds of the house receives direct sunlight. And on the summer solstice, no direct sunlight comes in. You know, nothing changes other than the sun angle. And like, you know, ancient people spent a lot of time looking at nature and, and, and observing, you know, shadow patterns and prevailing winds and sun angles and stuff like that. So, you know, after having, again, like, did the work and did the math and made that thing, and it turned out to be beautiful and efficient because, it, like Buckminster Fuller, it reflected the way that nature actually is. Like, part of what's going on with this work is that, as a culture, I think that we've gotten confused that the sign that stands for reality, that, that the man-made sign that represents the real nature is, is real. Yeah. Like we're walking around confused that the sign is the reality. And the sign is not the reality. The sign, the patterns that create reality and the cell phones exactly are not reality. That's the ultimate manifestation of it. You know, I'm like, it started with just simply creating a glyph that, that stood for this actual thing. So then you removed there was reality, let's make a glyph that stands for it. Now we don't have to deal with reality anymore. I control the glyph that controls the thing, so I'm like God. Yeah. You know, so I, yeah. I, I stand between you and God as a priest class. These same people that close the doors 
affirm our culture and you know protect power, use language and symbols and through advertising and all this stuff to and through different kinds yeah. of galleries than fun was. Yeah. I mean, not to be like that, but like that manifests in the oh, art yeah. world in a very specific well, way as well. A good example that of that was the show that Patty worked on. It was so important, you know, that that got that street art got a or graffiti art or you know writers, however you want to express it, people you know cipher. You got a, a museum show, but there was also another aspect of it too, where you know. Uh, people who were involved who had uh, put in buy recommendations on works in the past had to curate those works in that show and that was more of that same type of a thing you know what I mean like the ac academy reinforcing itself to say this is important but you know like I say Patty was kind of that saving grace yeah. with you know you know keeping it real and authentic yeah she wasn't driven she's not driven by profit margin of like creating these collections for uh, private clients through banks to try to, um, you know, uh, do collusion and buy up a, a show and then put it in a warehouse and, you know, then put it in an auction, to, you know, five, ten years later and cut a big check. You know, she's, um, you know, representing, giving voice to people who need to have a voice given to them, you know what I mean? And it's all, it's all just, it's all just one thing, you know what I mean, to me and you can tell I get, I get a little worked up and passionate about it. So, you know, I started after doing that house, like engineering uh, uh, meetings and architectural, uh, you know, like the, in Illinois, wherever all the engineers go to get their license renewed, ask me to come and talk about sustainable home design. So I could talk about math to all those people. And I did that for a few times, and then I started talking about that stuff to people outside of that community. And, and they would glaze over in like five minutes. So, you know, I'm like, all this stuff that I'm really passionate about, and uh, I'm like, I need to encode this into a visual language that will communicate these concepts in a way that is digestible. Now look, you did it. You made me give away the secrets. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, That's my job. No, actually, get it on no. Camera. It just looks cool. It's just, it just know, looks cool. Just, uh, Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's totally Forget intuitive. Forget what he just paid no attention. Cool. No, it's all to all that whole social redemptioning <laughs> mind control I'm over all of us. No, and we have to just hope that you're leading us in the right direction. <laughs> Trust me. That's what I've no. learned here today. You know, <laughs> hey, all the symbols that we take for granted as part of our culture are all derived from somewhere. You know, that shapes our reality, and uh, it's uh, you know it's important important stuff. Like I said, you know, it, it's magic. It, it, it participates, it's a give and take. Yeah. You know, reality is shaped by it, it shapes reality. The artists that, you know, Patty curated were influenced by comic books and things that they saw and, you know, uh, Frank Frazetta and things like that and they, they wanted to have their hand in it and then they did it and then now they shape the next generation. It's just like this continuous thing. It's a beautiful thing. Bucky would be proud. Don't cry. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions before we move? Yeah, anybody? All right. Yeah. Yes. I just have one question. Um, can you talk about bombs and missiles at all? <laughs> bombs and missiles? What are you seeing? Oh, these things? See, you see bombs there? <laughs> oh. that's, no, that's interesting. I um, No, I didn't okay. intend for those that's to look. Shock, that's a shock. Oh, chakra bomb. Well, <laughs> that's a, yeah. Chakra bomb. Well, that's just that reminds me of Fat Man. Um, yeah, I can see what you're, I can see what you're, this, you know, they're not, I didn't do that intentionally, but um, sometimes I want it to look like it could take flight, I mean, and, and it probably is a byproduct that, uh, you know, like that, the, the, the ones, um, like that, that chakra one, if you look at it, like that, that top head's a hexagon, and then there's a pentagon, there with a pentagram around it. But that's all in geodesic domes. Like this thing, like you see that it's this. Like in, in doing advertising materials for the nonprofit organizations that are you know, in Bucky's geodesic domes now, I had to redraw them. And I kept, I, I would see these patterns emerge out of those drawings that were just you know, beautiful. You know, they ended up looking like snowflakes. And that's because it reflects nature's geometry. And then, you know, I'm sure scientific innovations all you know, they're bound by the laws of physics, so they're going to reflect nature's geometry and... Uh, atomic bombs. 
atomic bomb? Right. <laughs> no, it is not an atomic bomb. <laughs> but no, you know, you, now that you say that, I saw like pictures of the inside of the like early atomic bombs that they were dropping, and the array of the objects inside of there are all on sacred geometric patterns. I mean, they're in, they're the dodecahedrons. They're like and um, it's it's so when those are the when you're tinkering with um, the uh, architect's blueprint, like the architect's blueprint, then, you know, there's a certain limited set of shapes and tools that just get repeated over and over again. So I guess that's probably what ends up happening. It, it looks like those things because they were dealing with physics and mixed sacred geometries and reflection physics, yeah. Yeah, no, and I love that. And then yet what I also appreciate too is as perfect as that is, you know, every piece has at least one or two moments where that's totally subverted. Yeah. So I'm looking at, you know, the dead center of this one in the middle where that one triangle, you know, bleeds out or, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so there's little moments yeah. where it's disrupted yeah. just a little bit. That's, and, that's the aesthetic part, yeah. you know what I mean? When I, you know, you get in, like you have a general idea of a concept you're trying to communicate and you have the medium medium has certain limitations about it like what it can do and how it's gonna act and like that all dictates what it looks like but then there's the, the chance and the happenstance and the stuff that you don't necessarily even know why you did it but you did and, and, and for some reason it's like oh, it feels good metaphysical metaphysical, it's metaphysical. <laughs> metaphysical. Right. yeah nice I, I mean they're really they're really ca I mean they they have that kind of feeling to them. Like they look, you know, they, they look like, you know, contemporary art, but then it doesn't take long for you, for the, uh, even the casual observer to kind of start to intuit that there's something else yeah. going on, you know, not very far below the surface, that there's a kind of feeling of a ritual or a feeling yeah. of, some, of something, even, even without having access to any of the things we've talked about here today, I think that, yeah. You know, you can kind of see that, well, and the little yeah. moments where the things in the wood, yeah, you know, help you, yeah, you know, help the grain, you, help you a lot. the direction of the right. grain, and that's so all, all that yeah. stuff. That's you know, that's that's in there. Yeah, and so it, you know what you've talked about is like a you know back and forth with the materials and yeah. sort of faith. What you know, what you find. I mean, that's the other thing. You're completely dependent on circumstance. What you I find. Know. I know. So that's a there's a patience and there's something there too where, you know, you I love a treasure hunt. Yeah. Right, and the yeah. whole thing's a treasure hunt. And yeah. so there's, you know, there's that part of what goes on, and and I think it all, the appeal of the work is that all there's some of all of that yeah. in there. At this, like I said before, at this all at the same time, these different levels that the work exists on that are parallel, as you said, yeah. like a, a highway with a lot of lanes, yeah. but all together. The one thing that really pushes my personal, and I, I I'm using the word fetish, but it, I don't mean sexually, but just like a fetish, is the, the patina or the age, like the rust in the, yeah. the, 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 like you can't fake that, you know what I mean? That's the thing that's real, and it's it, it represents time, which is like, you know, it, how do you represent time? You know, you can only represent it through the fossil record or through rust or through age and patina and wear. And I just think about like this. These came out of a were four joists of a flour mill on the Mississippi River, which is just relatively near us. That you know someone had carved in one of the joists 1904. So there's you know a hundred and you know whatever years. And don't put me on the spot. You don't have to. But <laughs> you could do sacred math, but you can't subtract. That's not geometry. From geometry. <laughs> <laughs> it's geometry that I'm doing. But no, you know what I'm saying? Like that. Me neither. Never mind. A lot yeah. of time. And then the tree. How yeah. old was the tree? You know what I mean? It's like count it, the rings, but yeah. how what old was the tree? Yeah. You have to go over here. Yeah. It's time. It's all time. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's amazing. It's just. It's like really. I just love it, but it, you know, it's just satisfies something about for me personally. Something magical. Mm -hmm. I love that. Tell more stories, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Questions, comments? Yes. Well, yes, please. I've been hoping. Well, one thing that's been circling a 
in my mind, as long as you've been talking, it's an idea Bucky had that there is no such thing as garbage, it's just resources in the wrong place. And whether it's prisons or garbage dumps, I mean, that was a principle. And once you hit grab onto one of its principles, it's applicable in so many situations. So I'm curious if you could talk about that idea. I there love that. There is no work. garbage, only resources in the wrong place. Yeah. Anything that's defined as garbage Preach. is a resource in the wrong place. And this connects the physical and metaphysical because everything has energy. So there's energy that's shoved away in garbage dumps or in prisons. Or, or in the social dynamic that we were yeah. talking about that gave rise to, to the early wall writers. Yeah, I mean, right. that's exactly... You're saying you're not real. Human resources yeah. that are you know, not wow. appreciated. It's the same. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, that is really it, essentially. Like, um, with the, using reclaimed materials, especially to build a house, you think about all of the energy that is embodied in it from its life growing and using resources, and then the energy that was expended by people in, you know, uh, 1890 to cut it down and mill it and transport it, and then the energy that was expended to build with it, and for that to be just allowed to, to just go to naught. You know what, you know what though? It wouldn't go to naught. I guess it would just, it just rot and it gets put back into the system and it you know, comes back out another way. But the, you know, the energy that's embodied in it you know, needs to be used and you know, continue to, to be used. And yeah, that's, that's, yeah that was, that's what's so appealing about Bucky. You know, he could so succinctly and brilliantly like, encapsulate all of that into some a statement like, you know, there there's you know resources that are just or yeah, garbage. What was the quote again? Uh, there's there no such thing as garbage, it's just resources in the wrong place. In the wrong yeah, place. yep, yep. And yep. I think that ties in actually in humans, for instance, to idea that everybody's a born genius and they're simply de genius as soon as they go to school. Right. And I think he truly believed that. Oh he you know, totally it sounds true. like something he said that you would discount. Yeah. He actually believed that. Yeah. So when you look at the schools and the prisons, how much energy is locked away or shut off or shut down. Excellent point. It's yeah. like uh, you want my chair up here? I, I, right? I think you should do it. You should do yeah. it. Where can we see the play is the question. Oh, it's a trip. It's, it's Buckminster Fuller, The History and Mystery of the Universe, which, you know, can I do another Bucky quote since we're on this? Yeah, so, while I write that lo down. Love is metaphysical gravity. And that sounds New Agey and weird, but this idea that love is the thing that like gravity draws you know matter and material together you know has like real like um application in the, even in the world of physics like you know post big bang like particles like exploding and speeding away from each other why should they ever want to like start to organize and you know become some sort of coherent system and start expressing that geometry that makes up everything you know what i mean and this this compulsion or this this um desire for unity and union and coming together, you know. But with space, I mean, I've heard people yeah, talk love. about like that principle operating in urban centers where everyone wants, everyone gravitates and wants to live in a city, but they all want to live alone in the city, yeah. right? Yeah. Like every, nobody wants, like they all want to live in this, these dense population zones because that's where all the excitement's happening. Yeah. But they want their own place in it where they are by themselves in it. Yeah. So you get these apartment buildings with everybody living alone yeah. in, in proximity to each other, and that is weirdly something they want. Right. And it reminds me a little bit, I mean, me too, right? But it reminds me a little bit about what you were saying about how the space between atoms and stuff. Yeah. Like, they're drawn together, but also, like, but not yeah. here. <laughs> that's, they together, yeah. but over there. I think, you, I mean, you yeah, know? that's so totally it. Yeah. That's what you're saying about how all of these concepts, once you get one in your mind, it can be integrated in so many. And that's the beauty of semiotics, is that you can transpose these ideas in yeah. words and, you well, know. I, this series of work, you know, using reclaimed materials and cutting up signage, I've tried to, I've given the name Myth, Math, and Magic. In that, so like the magic is like, you know, on a personal level of like what it means. And then the mythology is that same concept at work culturally, like in broad terms, you know what I mean? Like, and math is just how it's math, math is how and magic. Yes. God, we're like so hashtag rich here today. It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> We're all about magic, right? I mean, we've got, there's like 10 really, I hope you've been keeping track, Sarah. I have, actually. All right, good. Yes. So you can share. 
sweet. Oh my god, thank you for that. I feel like I should call him Bucky, but I didn't even know your real name, but I feel like I want to call you Buckminster. <laughs> thank you for Doug. the comment. DW Jacobs. Doug. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to keep an eye out for that yep. production. Um, awesome. Yeah, and it was he performed it in the uh, Fuller Dome, which is also called the Center for Spirituality and Sustainability. So there's this class words oh, for you. Spirituality. We, we worked so hard. <laughs> <laughs> to get away I brought it back. Thank you. <laughs> well, the, the, the experience of playing in that dome was incredible because anything with a play I could practically point to the dome and it would resonate sometimes on personal levels, sometimes metaphysical, physical, structural levels. But it was and then I performed it later on the East Coast in art school and I and I felt very lonely on stage and I realized because I didn't have that dome yeah. resonating everything I was doing. Yeah. Was, it was special. Art, and art school is lonely. Pardon? Art school is lonely. Just <laughs> 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 in general, it's not your fault. It's like a, that's a lonely experience. It's a lonely place. A lot of people here went there. But that's how we all know that it's a terrible lonely place, uh, right? Yeah. That where we became yes. what was the word? Degenius. <laughs> that's my new favorite word today too. I mean, this has been really. Words, wow. lots yeah. of words in the yeah. world. Yeah, I'm kind of sad that I can't be in one of those chairs just writing all this down. <laughs> this, oh, sure. Okay, thank you. Because there's a lot of really amazing, a, a lot of really you, unusual words, words we don't use enough today, God said today. But that's my happy place as a writer. So, yeah. Uh, sweet. I mean, myth, magic, and math. Myth, 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 math, myth. myth math, magic. Say that for three times fast. Myth, math, myth, myth magic. Math. Oh, I can't. <laughs> I'll be practicing, but um, gosh, thank you. Is, is there anything that you feel like we didn't do that you wanted to make sure we got on the record? Or I feel well, like we were pretty. Yeah, I mean, I I guess the idea of the word, you know, and it was a, an allusion to Ramsey, but it's also kind of a double allusion to the kind of biblical idea of the word, in that it's a um, creative force that that you know, literally in the Judeo-Christian you know, a concept is, uh, you know, things, the word created the world. Yeah, the first know, thing there ever was. In Genesis, yeah, the word. word. So it's like, yeah. I think, you know, for me that is, you know, it's, it, that's a mythology, and, and but, and uh, it references this idea that the tonal speaking, you know, like vibratory aspect of creation, you know what I mean? It's like- The energy. Yeah, yeah. The, of the word, yeah, like, and, uh, and I think that, you know, knowing, you know, when Ramelzy was talking about past life memories doing illuminated manuscripts, which, you know, would have been, you know, that same mythology, you know, I believe it wholeheartedly because, you know, how else are you going to, you know, have that idea to say word as an affirmative or word or what, you know, whatever version of word you're going to say, you know, that. And you believed him too, right? The past life thing. I mean, you what probably yeah, have more time talking to him about it than anyone. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, that's, um, I mean, that's the greatest experience that you have with an artist is, you know, they create this world and they're being generous enough and taking the chance to share it with you. And if you get around someone like that, you're a very lucky person. So Ram LZ, I'm like, whatever you say, man, I'm ready to go to the end of the universe with you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, that is like a perfect place. Yeah. <laughs> ready to go to the end of the universe together. <laughs> right? She's ready. Uh, awesome. Thank you guys. Wow, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.